I'm going to call up Mr. Yep. Paul Grimm. Many of you guys um, have seen him before. Uh, you know about his works. He has dedicated his life to this community, and for that, we are forever grateful. Uh, so without further ado, Mr. Grimm. Uh, I was asked to talk about Cystinosis West New, and, you know, uh, I have a, a, a situation where uh, I have a clinic here, and uh, we have, this is where all the patients have come from so far. We've now seen about 75 or 80 patients with cystinosis, which is pretty amazing because there's only around 600 or so diagnosed with this disease in the United States. This is an update. Just think of it as a, as a big smorgasbord, and I'm just going to pick and choose little bits of things. So for those who are not uh, living with cystinosis all the time, the, the problem with cystinosis is in the lysosome. So the lysosome is a recycling factory, and there are hundreds of lysosomes present in every cell in the body. And so, just like a recycling center, what the lysosome does is it takes used up proteins and breaks them down into the individual amino acids. And those amino acids are delivered out of the recycling center to the body to be reused. So just, just imagine you've got a, a recycling plant. And so there you go, uh, crap goes in, and then paper comes out, or glass comes out, and stuff like that. Now what happens one day if the paper truckers go on strike? And so the, the paper which is produced by the recycling factory doesn't have anywhere to go, so it stacks up. That's cystinosis, because with cystinosis the problem is the tiny little pump which is designed to deliver cysteine out of the lysosome back into the cells that can be used, that pump doesn't work. Paper trucker strike goes on, but the front office is still accepting deliveries. So stuff goes in, the glass still goes out, the metal still goes out, but the paper builds up and builds up until something happens. And that's the best example of how to think about cystinosis. So this cartoon, we've got a little lysosome there. Just imagine this is a microscopic view inside the cell. And the amino acid cysteine is part of all proteins. And so when your recycling factory, the lysosome, breaks down proteins, cysteine is supposed to be pumped out of the cell by a protein called cystinosin. And when someone has cystinosis, that protein doesn't work or isn't there. And so if it's not there, cysteine builds up and builds up. And then those crystals start precipitating. So this is images of tissues. So there's a kidney, and right in the middle of there, see these little glass-like things? That's cysteine damaging the kidney. Bone marrow, cysteine crystals damaging the blood production. Liver, cysteine crystals damaging the liver, and even cysteine crystals in the brain. So this is the disease which, although we think of it as a kidney disease originally, because that's where the first disease is, it affects the whole body. Malnutrition is an issue, but also sleep problems. As they get older, how do you deal with sleep odors? School issues. And even an enlarged bladder can happen because you pee so much. So, one of the things which is really new and interesting is the following. If you're in Europe, and you have cystinosis, and you're especially in France, all the patients are put on a drug called indomethacin. Indomethacin is a non steroidal anti-inflammatory agent which reduces how much urine they make. Now in the US we almost never put patients on endomethacin because we know that endomethacin itself damages the kidney. So you talk to the French cystinosis doctors and say, but of course all of my patients are on this. Whereas <laughs> here Americans only very rarely. So this just came out uh, in, uh, uh, in a me big meeting in Brazil in, uh, in August. So the Europeans looked at 327 patients with cystinosis, most in the UK, a bunch in France, and they looked at kidney function and various drug therapies. And they were shocked to find that if you were on indomethacin, the age that you went into kidney failure was actually delayed. So this is the age of kidney failure, CKD5. And so the dark line is the patients who were not on indomethacin, and the gray line is the patients who were on it. So for some reason, being on endomethacin actually delayed the progression of kidney failure. Big shock. In addition, 
when they looked at what was the things that helped people grow, and they looked at the fact that if you were born in the 2000s, your, your height, so this gray, this gray area here is the normal range. So if you were born in the 1970s and 80s, they tended to be quite short, 1990s less short, 2000s even less short. One of the things that was striking was if you were on indomethacin, you were much taller than the patients who were not on indomethacin for more than half of the follow-up. So not only does it actually protect the kidney function, but it actually seems to help you grow better. So this data has really sent a big shockwave through the cystinosis community because in America we used to always think, you know, we shouldn't put them on it because it's damaging to the kidney, but now this has come out and we have to figure out, well, why is the difference? Is it because the doctors who had them on in the methicin, we're treating them in a different way, or is it in the methicin itself? You could take the oral medications to uh, help uh, treat the cystinosis all you want, but because the cornea doesn't have a blood supply, you have to use drops. And the current therapy requires drops every hour while awake, and they sting. And it's hard to do. But if you don't do the drops, what we know is that sooner or later the cornea gets damaged and what we're seeing here is scarring on the cornea. So this is called band keratopathy. And so if you don't do the drops, sooner or later you develop blindness. But how much drops do you really need? So the drug company that put together the studies and the NIH studies, they wanted to really make sure that you got excellent treatment. And so they said, what's the most we can ask? And that's every hour, while awake, around the clock. So I have patients who, you know, they have uh, uh, the school nurse gets them every hour or every two hours and they get drops. And there's no doubt the medication works and the cornea can completely clear. And as long as it hasn't gone to the point of scarring, then you can completely heal the corneas. But has no one ever did the studies, what is the least number of drops? Because, you know, just imagine, if your child has to go to the school nurse every hour, the other kids think there's something wrong with that child. And it's hard to do. Well, it turns out that more and more eye doctors who deal with cystinosis have recognized that when you put the drops in the eye, the material only lasts for 10 minutes. And then your tears wash them out. So, if it only lasts for 10 minutes, why can't you give it every 10 minutes, but only for a short period of time? So more and more of my patients don't do the drops in school. What they do is they come home after school and they watch a TV show and every eyes are clear. So if you start changing that protocol, you make sure your eye doctor is checking regularly to make sure that's good for your child. But we know that they don't have to go to the school nurse every hour. We know they don't have to interrupt your day. And when you put in the eye drops, your eyes are clogged for five or ten minutes anyway, so you can't really do screens, you can't use the computer, you can't read your book. So that's a nice change that we're seeing that's making care easier. Another group are putting in are, are, are working on a a sort of a little soft gelatin pellet that you could just drop into the lower conjunctival sac at bedtime. So then it would bathe the eyes all night. So that in the morning you don't have to work on drops throughout the day. So that's kind of cool. So there's a lot of interesting things happening in the eye, uh, in the eye world. But for right now, we know that the drops, if you use them regularly, prevents blindness. Well, patients with cystinosis used to all pass away by the time they were 10 or 12 years old because of kidney failure. And then in the 1970s and 1980s, we learned how to treat kidney failure, and we learned how to keep these people alive with dialysis and the transplant. And what we then found out was that they grew to adulthood all the other parts of the body that are affected by cystinosis. So when they looked at 36 adult patients aged 17 to 34, most of them had thyroid failure, almost a third had difficulty swallowing, many had weakness of their hands, a quarter were blind. And what they died from was because they were weak. They couldn't swallow liquids without inhaling them. They couldn't cough because they were weak. And so muscle weakness was actually the thing that caused them to pass away. And this is pictures of patients 
Some of the earliest signs of muscle weakness are in the muscles right here. So here when I do this, I've got a nice little bulge there. And the patients with cystinosis, especially if they hadn't been taking their cystemine therapy, lost that. Notice, you can see how clearly the bones in the, in the scapula are, because he's deficient in his deltoids. And here, here, I have a patient who's almost 50. Uh, to shake my hand, he goes like this, because he can't bring his arms up. Because for many years, he couldn't take cystemine therapy. People with, uh, who were unable to take cystemine therapy had issues of brain problems. So we know if you can take the cystemine therapy regularly, it really helps. But we're also finding that there's another piece to the story. So at Stanford, we've done a large study paid for by the Cystinosis Research uh, Foundation where we did uh, DEXA studies to look at fat, muscle, and bone density. We did very careful measurements of muscle strength. And we did something called quantitative CT. So, so there's only a couple of machines like this in the country where we could take pictures of the uh, distal, distal arm and the distal ankle. Here you see this guy's got his ankle in the machine here, and this one has his hand in the machine. And what, we're, what we found was in patients who look well, in patients who are taking the medication well, we found profound decrease in muscle bulk and strength, even though they look perfectly normal. And the youngest we studied was a six-year-old, but it's throughout the ages. And what we're recognizing now is <clears throat> that cystinosis is more than just having the lysosomes overloaded with cystine. It turns out that the cystinosin protein interacts with the, with the metabolism of energy. So the TOR complex is very important at growth of the cells, at the how strong the cells are, at uh, turning uh, the instructions from DNA into protein, and, and here muscle and stuff like that. And so what people have recently recognized is there's some interaction with cystinosin and the important energy regulators of the cell. So even if patients are well treated, there's something else going on, and so we're trying to figure that out. But we know that cystinosin is critical to this structure called mTOR, which is totally important in regulation of muscle strength and energy in the cells. And uh, there are some patients who have cystinosin problems where cystine transport uh, is affected, but the interaction with torque isn't affected. And these people look really, really healthy. They have cystinosis. We see the crystals in their cells, but they are much stronger than most.